Now, who here has heard of Andrew Tate? Really? I never heard of him. Now, one mother, Darcy, tweeted, I didn't know who Andrew Tate was, but my 12-year-old son did. So parents, they're coming for your boys. They market misogyny and racism. And when I say they, there's a broad range of people out there and they're not all the same. So I don't wanna lump everybody together. Tate claims to be helping young men acquire lots of money, drive luxury cars and pick up hot women. But last August, he was banned on social media for his misogynistic viewpoints some of which I can't repeat on daytime television. And then just last month, Tate and his brother were detained by Romanian authorities in connection with a human trafficking, rape, and organized crime investigation. If you give a man true free reign, completely be who you want to be and you don't let society program you, he's gonna drive a fast car, he's gonna have a bunch of women, he's gonna wanna have a bunch of money, he's gonna do whatever he wants, right? Whether a woman wants to be a lawyer or a housemaker or a webcam girl. Unless she has a man directing her, she's gonna up. They're just not built to be completely independent creatures. Men and women are not the same. We've never been the same. This new think idea that men and women are the same is complete garbage that's been invented, right? If a woman sleeps with multiple people, that's cheating. That's absolutely unacceptable on every level. If I have a woman who I truly love and I go out and I come back to her and I don't care about her and I only love my girl, that's not cheating. That's exercise. If she even talks to a dude, it's cheating. Because females are emotionally invested. I have no emotional investment. <laughs> oh, okay. Some of the women here, I think, might disagree with that a little bit. Uh, moms out there, if you have a son, I bet you have no idea what is happening out there. So you might want to pull up a chair and listen. Our first guest, 24-year-old Ben, says when he was a teen, he had zero self-esteem, never got past the first date, and felt powerless with girls. But he says men like Andrew Tate inspired him to break out of his shell. A woman's primary biological role is to make kids. So the more fertile she is, the prettier she is, the more feminine sexual energy she has, but for men, our primary biological purpose is to build things. A high status, high value man is a man who builds valuable things. That's where his masculine and sexual energy comes from. So a man's gonna judge a woman first and foremost by how fertile she is. That's why men care about a woman being soft. Men care about a woman being pure and healthy and nurturing, good at cooking, cleaning and all that jazz, while women care about a man's status and a man's value because that shows how good he is at building things, how good he is at uh, taking care of his body and being strong enough to protect her and her children. It's not unfair that men care more about looks than women do. It's just how nature designs. Wow, so you understand women. Yeah. How do you understand women so well? Oh, just life experience. I've put myself out there a lot and uh, had my fair share of learning. I've read a lot and experienced a lot of different perspectives and did my best to pull them all together. You're a sexual energy coach. Yes. W help me with that. W what is a sexual energy coach? So I help men with their mindsets, getting in touch with their masculinity, uh, figuring out their goals and what sorts of action steps they can take to make those goals real when it comes to dating and relationships. Uh -huh. But you don't have a girlfriend. Not at the moment, no. Okay. So you're telling other people how to get girlfriends and you don't have one. <laughs> well, I teach them how to get in touch with their masculinity. Okay. And so my clients have found girlfriends because of me. Okay. And how do you define masculinity? Uh, integrity under pressure. And you, you were saying that women want a man that what? Uh, they want a man who knows what he values, a man who's good at building something, a man who's you know, multi-dimensional and integrated, who can be masculine, but is also uh, emotionally aware, intelligent, and fearless when it comes to achieving his goals. Are you an Andrew Tate adherent? 
Uh, I'm not a dogmatist by any means, but I do think that he's serving a valuable role. I think that he's making a positive difference, and he does say a lot of controversial things because he's an extreme person. Like, he's not your normal, average guy. I wrote down some of the things that he said, some of them I, I absolutely cannot repeat. But he says, I think my sister is her husband's property. Would you agree with that line of thinking? Uh, not in the literal sense, no. Well, I understand. I, he doesn't have, yeah, well, I mean, he doesn't own her. Women are but, obviously people, not objects, but uh -huh. it's uh, one way of looking at things, you know, misogynistic as that might be. He, he describes a sexual encounter and says, that's how it goes. Slap, slap, grab, choke, shut up, bitch, sex. That's how it should be. Well, if it's consensual, then it's all good. Okay. He says, I'm not a blanking rapist, but I like the idea of being able to do what I want. And I don't believe women are as smart as men. Huh. Well, that was really... Oh, it sounds really misogynistic. Do you, in it. do you agree with that? He says, I'm not a blanking rapist, but I like the idea of being able to do what I want. And I don't believe women are as smart as men. Huh, well, that was really... Oh, it sounds really misogynistic. Do you, in it. Do you agree with that? Uh, not entirely, no. We might not have the same biological roles, but I think women are really smart overall yeah um do you think there is a pecking order in a relationship uh i wouldn't say a pecking order i would say that uh men bring certain strengths women bring other strengths mm -hmm. you say boys will be boys is that a good thing or a bad thing and what's it mean huh, i think it's a good thing i mean for boys to be boys explore the masculinity, find ways to meaningfully challenge themselves and grow. Yeah. You said when you were younger, you were an aimless loser. I was kind of a coward. And yeah. when I was in high school, I, uh, I decided that I'm going to get to decide who I get to be in life. So I decided I'm going to be a strong, masculine guy. And so I got into lifting weights, I got into self-development, and eventually I put myself out there in the dating world a lot, and I learned a lot and grew a lot, and I would say I'm a pretty strong, confident guy now. You said the more muscle I put on, the more affordable, attractive, healthy girls will be available to you. How does that work? Uh, well, because the more muscle you have on your body, the more testosterone your body produces to maintain it, and the, and working out, it uh, raises your testosterone and it uh, masculinizes you. And the feminine women are attracted to masculine men. Really? Yeah. You talked about the greatest harm to men right now. You said there's, there's a lack of positive masculine role models and that Andrew Tate is stepping in to fill that role. Exactly. Okay. And, and you think in a positive way. And the greatest harm for women, you said teaching women to not value the right things, to go for men that are soft and not masculine. It's part of the picture. So I'm far from the only guy who's ever felt like no one ever taught him how to be a man growing up. And so I've had my mentors, I've had my learning experiences, and it's there's no like one guy who I look up to. It's, right. it's, it's a bunch of men I've known who've sure. you know, taught me what I could be, what I could become. And Andrew Tate is not nearly one of the most important ones, but I do see the value he's adding. Like there are a lot of young men, boys out there, who maybe their father's not in their life. They've had a weak father. They haven't had many positive male role models growing up. And to them, they're seeing Andrew Tate as an aspirational figure. Like they don't have to, you know, aspire to be 100% like him. They don't have to have the same goals, take the same action he's taking. But he's one guy of many who's showing them that they could be more, more than just some coward, more than just some weak guy who doesn't know how to stand up for himself, doesn't know how to stand up for what he believes in.
Yeah, you said that uh, women are not guided by love. They're being guided by an evil agenda. Well, there's been a lot of programming out there that's taught men and women to hate each other instead of love each other uh -huh. in the past decade especially. And so there's a lot of messages in the media, in society, that's making men afraid of women and making women afraid of men instead of loving each other, instead of you know, leaning into our natural roles and our personalities. And what's the evil part? Evil part? Well, anything that promotes hatred, anything that promotes division on whatever part of the political ideological spectrum it is. So anything that's teaching you to hate someone else or look down on someone else for any reason. Yeah. So do you have women friends? Oh, yeah. I have some female friends who I yeah. value. Yeah. Do you hope to get married someday? Oh, yeah, eventually. Yeah. Uh, it's not a very pressing goal of mine right now. I have a lot of other things I'm focusing on, but down the line, yes. Okay. All right. Well, when we come back, should we be worried about something called the manosphere and our sons? Well, I'm going to ask the godfather of the manosphere because he's here and he's going to tell us what that's all about. And you can decide if you think it's something you should be worried about. And I want to hear from the audience. We'll be right back. When you're 30, you can still land a pretty 22-year-old girlfriend, but a woman at 30, she might be beautiful, she might be sexy, but she is past her prime. And both sexes viscerally know this. A regular gal at 25, her sexual value, her sexual abundance is starting to go. Have some empathy for women. They go through worse problems than you do in the dating world. You think 25 is, they're kind of going over the, uh, the hump? Well, it's one way to look at things. Because nature's designed us to build things. It's designed women to carry children, carry healthy children. And so young women are more fertile. Like, that, that's not the entire picture of a woman's value. But biologically, younger women are just what men go for. Okay. Um, well, uh, Rolo Tomasi is a blogger, author, and YouTuber whose 2013 book, The Rational Male, has come to be considered the unofficial Bible of the manosphere. Now, he says everything that you hear from Andrew Tate is usually a derivative of his book and his teachings. We have women who are building themselves up according to this strong, independent, female empowerment narrative. And as a result, all they've done is become the man that they wanted to marry. And guys don't want to have anything to do with that. So what do I tell them? What do I tell that chick who's 26 years old, who's probably making more money than most of the guys I know? She's an alpha male, right? What do I tell her? Dumb yourself down? The first thing out of my mouth is, well, you need to be more feminine, right? Get in touch with your feminine side. You've got to invest in your beauty, invest in your femininity, rather than, you know, being worried about, like, starting some gourmet cupcake retail outlet. Because if I don't, then I'm not feminine, and then they're not going to want to get with me. Oh, well, you mean I'm going to be 38 and lonely? I guess I'll die alone? Yeah, unless you do something. And if that sounds like dumbing yourself down, then I don't really know what else to tell you. Bro, well, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. So your book and the things that you espouse predated Andrew Tate. Uh, by about 10 years. All I do is present facts. And what happens is, is particularly now, and I've been doing this for about 20 years, um, uh, you will see a lot of come-ups right now who want to uh, take it and run with it on TikTok. They want to take it and run with it on Instagram. We live in the, uh, the social media age. And a lot of the uh, work that I've done really for about 20 years right now um, gets distorted quite a bit. And I think we're at that point right now where things are getting distorted. And again, to the point where I've got to come on the Dr. Phil show and be an apologist for, for Andrew Tate, which I am not going to do. Yeah. So Whenever, why do they call you the godfather of the manosphere? <laughs> the manosphere is sort of a consortium of guys who get together and they compare notes. So the manosphere proper started right around, uh, I would say, 2002 
in forums. Um, it uh, developed and evolved out of the old pickup artist seduction community uh, forums that were online at that time. And then it developed into the blog era, and then it developed into the uh, social media era, and now here we are in the YouTube era. And um, it's been, like I said, about 20 years coming right now, but the Manosphere proper is, um, is a consortium of guys who get together and they compare notes about really three main things, money, muscles, and game. So, and by game, I use game in the terms of social skills at this point, so. And these pickup artist sites that you're talking about, people were putting up websites and all about how to pick up women. That originally, it was discussions on forums where men all over the world would get together and say, let's compare notes. Let's compare notes, let's get together, and let's see if we can figure this out. Well, I've seen a lot of seminars and stuff where you can sign up and take a course and they, guarantee you if you have trouble getting dates or picking up women they tell you that they guarantee you you take this course you'll date the hottest girl in the room and i don't know anyone cetera, that is guaranteeing that at this stage i don't think anybody has ever guaranteed that however if there is a benefit and net benefit for that it is a fact that you can take a guy such as ben here and level him up from say a five to a six, is that not an improvement? If you went from being ordinary to being somewhat extraordinary, is that not a net benefit to a, to a gentleman like Ben? 24. That's 24. 24, 24 years old, so weeks. we're looking at a gen, gen, so gen Z, you're looking at a generation that was acculturated and socialized behind a screen. We have a, a, a generation of what we call lost boys right now who don't have a father figure, they don't have, they don't have any guidance, whether, it, whether it's masculinity or much else for that matter. And so, of course, if I can say, hey, look, uh, I've got, I'm an older gentleman and I can help level you up and common sense is so rare right now, we can commodify it, <laughs> then I'm going to go and do my best to help men. I'm not in the business of helping men become better men. I'm in the business of helping men have the tools and the equipment so that they can build their own lives. You, you say the greatest problem with men is men are purposeless mm -hmm. and sedated by pornography, online video games, alcohol, or marijuana. Yes, absolutely. Um, what do you mean sedated they're, by? Their escapisms is what they are. If your crummy life is, uh, if your escapisms are better than your crummy life, then you're going to dwell more in those escapisms. So what do men do today where they're addicted to pornography? Anyone in this room on their, on their phone can go get hardcore pornography anytime they want to. There's a reason why it's free. If you go and you look at uh, marijuana being, um, being legalized, if you look at the opioid epidemic right now, if you look at the way we sedate men today, that is the number one, I think anyways, is the number one problem that we're looking at for really the latter half of the millennial generation and all of Generation Z right now. Yeah, and you, you talk about that the suicide rate for men is three to three, three and, and a half, half to, five, to times five times, depending on whose numbers you're looking at and what the demographics are. Yeah, than it is for women. Mm -hmm. And you interpret that as meaning what? I interpret that as meaning that those are deaths of despair. We, we have a term for that right now. Men get zeroed out. They build up lives, they build up personalities, they build up uh, what life equity, let's just say. They lose a job, they lose their, their wives, they lose out on something, and no one is there to tell them how to bounce back from that rejection, how to bounce back from that defeat, how to come back from being zeroed out. So they're faced with two really very real decisions. One is rebuild yourself or delete yourself. And unfortunately, most men are deleting themselves right now. Most men are deleting themselves. What? Well, the prime demographic for suicide for men right now is 45 to 65 years old. It's, it's what they call deaths of despair. Um, we, we constantly harp on the fact that men don't have friends, they don't have close friends, they don't have the same networks that women do. Um, and then we put the blame for their mental health back on them by saying it's toxic masculinity and if you guys were just more like women, then you would reach out for therapy of some sorts. If women were killing themselves at four times the rate that men are, you would have a dedicated month and the NFL would change their uniforms to pink or something else so that, so that we would have some sort of female suicide prevention month. But we don't see that right now. 
because we blame it on toxic masculinity. What do you mean when you say media celebrates masculinity as equaling acting feminine? Well, that's the only time that the, the mainstream media will ever celebrate masculinity is when you see the rock in a tutu. Whenever you see, um, whenever you see men behaving conventionally feminine, that's when the media decides to celebrate it. But yet when a guy is acting in a conventionally masculine way, we do not celebrate that and we find some way to demonize that. And what's conventionally masculine? Men are, by and large, in, in a general sense, 99.9% .9 uh, larger, more muscular, more physically adept than women are. So we can look at what are the traits that are, that are associated with that. You know, determinism, uh, determination. How are men more well, determined than well, women? Me well, ment mentally speaking, um, if you look at um, the differences, the genetic differences between men and women, men tend to be more interested in things. Women tend to be more interested in people. Women tend to be in the social fields. Men tend to be in the more mechanical fields. So if there's a conventional masculinity, it's related to the way that our brains are structured. It doesn't have anything to do with social social constructionism. Yeah. Right, well, when we come back, we're going to meet a father who says men have been left behind. We'll be right back. Opportunities to cheat for pretty much my entire marriage. The healthiest way to have a good marriage is to have opportunity, but she gives you no reason, and so she takes care of you. Now, there's a lot of other guys who are in the same boat, right? They are with a woman who takes care of them even though they have the opportunity to cheat. Those guys, the women that they're with, realize that that guy is the kind of guy that other men want to be and other women want to be. And so as there's that hindbrain realization of that, prompts behavior on the part of that woman to say, you know what, he's a good dog, but I got to pet him to keep him on the porch. Well, parents today say they're more worried about their sons becoming successful adults than their daughters. So what's troubling young men today? Now, I brought together some people who presume to know about this because they spent time looking into it. Richard Reeves is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute and wrote the book of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling, Why It Matters, and What to Do About It. Now, Marilyn York is a men's rights attorney. And Imrod Ahmed is a CEO and the founder of the Center uh, for Countering Digital Hate. So thanks to all three of you for joining the conversation. <laughs> Mary, let me start with you. You've been listening so far. What do you have to add to the conversation before I ask you any specific questions? Anytime a man tries to interpret a woman, it's embarrassing. And anytime we try to interpret a man, it's embarrassing. Like we need to stay in our lane a little bit more. When I hear a man telling me what I want as a woman, there's just some misconceptions being thrown about as though the generalities are true. And we're missing a huge component of relationships that's a really important one, and that's intimacy. We're talking all about prestige and relationships have two components at their very base, intimacy and prestige. And every relationship at its core is a mix of the two. Even take the super old rich guy and the super young hot girl, there is a component of intimacy to their relationship that works for them. In addition to the prestige that comes with his success and his monetary gain and her beautiful body and her youth. And so I feel like we're missing it and we're doing a disservice to both genders. And the other thing is it always feels like a gender battle. Like it's always men versus women. And even at home, I cannot talk about this with my own husband. I cannot talk about men's rights with him. I want to kill him in about 30 seconds. And I'm like, I'm on your team. Like, I represent dudes, and I hate you. And I'm never extreme enough for him. And he likes to spew facts at me. Like, men are always guilty when the police come. I'm like, what? Who? Have you been arrested? I, last time I checked, you've never even been investigated. What do, you, what do you mean this always happens? He's like, you know it's true. It's a fact. I'm like, oh, my God, it's a fact again. And I do know it's true. I actually watch my poor male clients get arrested for ridiculous stuff all day. I can give you 100 case studies that would break your heart. But when he says that, I want to deck him. And why? Why does it have to be that way? Why can't I just calm down and listen and not be in competition? And I can't. I fail, at least at home. I'll try to do better for you, doctor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Tell me if you're going to deck me right before you do it, right? <laughs> now, Richard, what do you think about Andrew Tate? 
<laughs> well, first of all, everybody has heard of Andrew Tate. Uh, certainly everybody who's under the age of 40. He had 12 billion views on TikTok. He was searched four times as much as recession, uh, for example. And so people know who he is. And I think I was actually listening to, to Ben earlier, and I have three, three sons in their 20s as well. I've got to tell you, the paternal instinct in me was coming out very, very strongly listening to you. Uh, I really felt where you were coming from. But I also think the fact we're having this conversation this way tells us what a horrible mess we've got ourselves into. It is quite true that we don't have a positive vision of masculinity that we're passing on, but it has to be one that is compatible with equality between men and women. We need a positive script that we can give to our boys, and I've tried to raise my sons this way, but not one that in any way makes seem women seem lesser. We don't have to make women seem less for men to be more. And that's right. And, and, and some, of, some, of what you say, some of what you say has some real truth to it. There are some biological differences between us, but they're not determinative. They don't determine your role. You say the biological role. Women, women are designed to bear children. Well, duh. I think most women know that they bear children, but that doesn't mean that that's their destiny. That's an idea we left behind in the 19th century. And so we've got to find a way to have a really positive script for our boys that is different to femininity. I agree with that. There are differences. But it's got to be one that's fit for the 21st century. And I've got to tell you, that means one that absolutely looks women in the eye as our absolute equals. Even if we're different in some important ways, we are absolutely equal. Our relationships have to be built on that equality. So let's, let's get on with the task of a positive script for masculinity that is not anti-women. Yes. Do you think that's possible? Let's get on with the task of a positive script for masculinity that is not anti-women. Yes. Do you think that's possible? No, I think, uh, I think equality is a canard right now. <laughs> equality is defined by what? See, the thing about Equal is, opportunities. Okay, equal opportunities. A but female yet we, president. But yet, okay. Female, women on college campuses. Okay. So equal those pay. are equality of outcome right now, right. not equality of opportunity. We have right. equality of opportunity. What you're, what, on this side of the fence anyway, is, is advocating for is equality of outcome. And that's the real problem that we're looking at right now. The other part of this is that what is equality defined by? So if I have certain strengths, that make me better at a particular task, right. and you do not, then, I, then there is no equality between the two of us, if you can see what I'm saying here. Okay, this is the right argument. So. Can, I, can I respond? Sure. This is the right argument. So you mentioned the difference between men and women in terms of men being a bit more into things mm -hmm. and women being a bit more into people. Yes, I believe you quoted right. Dr. Pinker in your own book. Yes, and that's true. But it's not true that all men are into things and all women are into people. But the distribution are, are than are yes. not on so the So what that suggests, curve. based on work that I've looked at, is that under conditions of equal opportunities, you wouldn't have 50% of engineers would be women. It would be about 30% of engineers would be women. Mm. Right now, it's 15%. Now, you might say, well, of course only 15% of engineers are women. Their brains don't work like that. Whereas I would say, I think we've got quite a long way to go. I have a question about what y'all are going are, back and forth about. So what? What the hell difference does it make? What's that have to do with equality? The fact that if men are more into right. things and women are, are more into... Let me choose. Yeah. What, what difference? So what? What does that have to do with equality? Because, look, I've, I've been married 46 years. I've been with my wife for 50 years. We've been married 46, and we are not alike in so many ways. But let me tell you, I don't want to be married to me. <laughs> I, I guarantee you. I think you. we can all agree. Yeah, no <laughs> That's I don't want unanimity be, on that. Point. No, I don't want to be married to <laughs> someone that thinks like I do, acts like I do, behaves like I do. I don't want to be married to a mirror image of myself. But I think I want right. to be married to somebody but, that is different, but that doesn't mean that one of us is is more or less than the other person. We I'm, just bring different ingredients to the agree. table. All I'm arguing is these are differences on average. And they're going to differ in different places. Hearts. Richard's talking about but we are equality to one when it comes to opportunity, which I agree with. And Rolo's talking about equality when it comes to outcomes, which he says, you know, we can't predict and we can't create. But I think there, Rolo wants it for men. There are I think things, you want outcomes for men to improve. Yeah, there you are, just don't well, write about I, female what, outcomes. Okay, what I would like to see is, is for, especially for men, is a, a, a focus on it, for a, a focus on masculinity to begin with yeah. at all, 
because we can't even have this conversation. Right. We could not have this conversation at a major university in the United States right now without somebody shouting. Hang on, hang on. Uh, let me interrupt because I, I, I want you guys to know who Imran is. Uh, he was instrumental in taking Tate down from YouTube. Uh, why was that important to you? Because the ideas that he spread are toxic to the young men that he's primarily being fed into. The TikTok algorithm is set up in a way that it feeds you the most controversial content first. Andrew Tate himself understands the algorithm in the way that digital natives do. Within two and a half minutes of opening a new TikTok account, you're being fed Andrew Tate videos. Right. And that's why he's one of the most seen men in the world, talking about men. And the problem is that the ideology that he, of course, is based on yours, Rollo, which is, you know, one way of looking at the world. I don't think it necessarily leads to great outcomes for people. I don't think it leads to great outcomes for relationships. Oh my God, the is problem that is that your ideology, your ideology is phenomenally reductive, and ultimately it leads to failure. And yet and I've been responsible ideas, for those taking ideas, the noose off of millions of men's necks and those for, the ideas, last, for the last 12 years. Those ideas when amplified, when, when, when added with the social media overlay of controversy, it's led to lots and lots of young men being taught by Andrew Tate that the re way to treat a woman if she disrespects you is to grab her by the neck and grab a machete. Again, I'm not here to be an apologist for someone who has taken my work and distorted it into his red meat social media empire. What do you mean you, you took the noose off of men? What do you, what do you mean? took the noose off of men. What do you, what do you mean? What I'm saying is that I've, I've been, well, my work has been at least so, in some way instrumental in preventing suicides. It causes harm to women. You talk about suicide. What's the primary cause of young women dying in, the, in America? You tell me. Man. Partner violence. Yeah. Because men are violent. We have a proclivity for violence. We have you better have trait great aggression than we do agreeable. You, have this, you claim to have this great compassion for young men yeah. who you say are harming themselves. And yet, when I say to you that the greatest, that the thing that's killing young women is men, you sneer with such anger at me. And you, you know say to what, me, do you know what actually, the, men you know are being what the number one way of men So men are killing right men now. and men are killing women too. It's not suicide. It's a male on male yeah. violence as yeah. well. We've got some audience members listening to all this, and I see some of you really squirming. If you got a comment or question, raise your hand right now. Hi, my name is Melissa, and I was just thinking how you were saying that, you know, women are more likely to be this way and men are more likely to be this way. But a lot of it is we are raised to be that way, and we, without even having a choice. So I don't understand where the, you're coming from with that. Okay, that's because you believe in social constructionism as a primary way of socializing human beings right now. You have natural proclivities as a woman, as a man, that are going to express themselves regardless of societies across the board. It's not all socialization, if, if anything. The nature versus nurture discussion in that debate has been over since the mid-2000s. Nothing is all or nothing. Right is what I'm trying to say. Exactly, but what I'm so, saying is that you're, you have innate proclivities as a woman, as a man, that are going to express themselves. So again, as I was saying, in gender neutral societies, men are going to lean one way, women are going to lean another way. It's not because they were taught that way, it's because that that's what their natural innate inclination is. All right, we're out of time uh, for today, but we'll be continuing this conversation. You won't want to miss our next discussion on this topic when we talk to a group of teenage boys and their mothers about Andrew Tate and toxic masculinity. Their mothers were surprised by what they heard, and trust me, you will be too. Andrew Tate has a huge impact on what teenagers think now. Like, everyone wants to be like him, like rich guy, Bugatti, you know, all that like rich lifestyle. He's very positive about how to be successful, go to the gym, get a good mentality. I'm influenced by Andrew Tate. I want to thank all of my guests. For more information about today's episode, or if you'd like to share your story, log on to drphil.com. If you want to add your voice to the conversation, uh, you know where to find me. Uh, on social media platforms. If you're in LA or you plan to be, we'd love to have you join us up here on stage. Just go to drphil.com, click on be part of the audience for all the details. Now, the new season of my podcast, Mystery and Murder Analysis by Dr. Phil is out right now. I'm doing a really deep dive on the case of Sherry Papini, Supermom Missing. You can check it out for free on all podcast platforms. 
Check out Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret with Robin McGraw, and find out about living above your means and why it's a recipe for disaster. Ramid Sati is a financial advisor and New York Times bestselling author is going to give the Secret Squad practical tips on how to live your fullest, richest life without being stingy. You can listen for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or really wherever you listen to podcasts. Stay safe. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much, everybody.
on an all-new Dr. Phil. I've been on probably 300 first dates. He's 47 years old and has never had a girlfriend. I did a show with people that are dating convicted murderers, and they won't go out with you. Yeah. Now. You posted, it's Labor Day. Any women want to go into labor nine months from now? The posts and pics that might keep him single. I have some good news. This is going to get better. It has to, because you got no game. Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. question how many single ladies are here today <laughs> all right I'm surrounded uh, how many of you are online dating right now okay a few say you're on a dating app swiping and judging swiping and hoping to find the one and you come across this guy he says I'm looking to go to Tuscany anyone want to come along and then there are three pictures of Adam. Okay. Now, by applause, would you ladies swipe right and go out with Adam? So maybe you friend the guy, Adam, on Facebook before you date so you can scroll through his pictures. Well, here's what you would find on Adam's page. Okay. Now, that's a colorful group of pictures, right? Either way, he appears as though he likes to have fun, right? One more picture I want to show you, ladies, but sorry, viewers at home, you won't be able to see this because, well, it's just too inappropriate for the FCC. This is Adam's Halloween costume. It's a used feminine product. Now what do you ladies think about Adam? <laughs> but wait, there's more. Here's Adam's Facebook post on Labor Day. Any single women out there who want to go into labor nine months from now? Give me a call. Any takers? Okay, 47-year-old Adam wants to know why he's never had a girlfriend. You heard me right, never in 47 years. No woman has ever loved him. By 50, he says he wants to be married with children, but fears he will never get there if he can't snag a third date. I've been on probably 300 first dates, but I've never had a relationship. I think at last count, there were 11 girls that I went out with, and on the next date, they either married that guy or had kids with that guy or both. I have used almost every dating app, Bumble, Tinder, It's Just Lunch, Coffee Meets Bagel, Match, eHarmony. I've changed my profile multiple times based on articles that I read. The number one city that you should put on your profile is Tuscany. They say show pictures with you and your dogs, show pictures with a group. Hello, I'm Hi, Adam. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you. When I meet a woman for the first time, I generally tend to talk way too much, and I just tell them a lot about me. I don't leave too much to the imagination. I don't want to play hard to get because I'm available. I'm pretty open if I see a cute person at the fruit section, be like, oh, so how do you know if an avocado is ready to be eaten? Some people state that that comes across as desperate, but for me, I think it comes across as interested. Girl, you might me of an overdue library book because you got fine written all over you. I really want to have a child one day. No matter how hard I try, I cannot figure out what women want. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, <laughs> I have some good news. Okay. This is going to get better. Okay. It has to. Because you can't fall off the floor. All right. And you, you got no game. 
All right. Right? Now, this is coming from a guy that hadn't been on a date in 47 years, because I've been with the same... I mean, I haven't been on a new date in 47 mm -hmm. years, because I've been with the same woman for 47 years. Um, so... So, I, I admit I'm not, like, current on the club scene or any of that, or I would get clubbed. Um, so, but, you, look, uh, you admit you don't know squat about what to do, right? I would agree with that assessment. Based on results, according to you, you're 47 and don't have a girlfriend, have never had a girlfriend, can't get a third date. So, based on results, it's not speculation, you suck at dating. <laughs> Don't clap for that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just true. You get friend-zoned yes. or rejected, one of the two. Yes, correct. Okay, and I I've studied you, and I think that the, the problem is it's a mispresentation, a miscommunication, because everything I've seen and studied about you, I actually think you're a nice guy. Well, thank you. And so I, I think you're misrepresenting yourself. I did a show not long ago with people that are dating convicted murderers, and they won't go out with you. Well, that's, that's a positive spin. <laughs> and see, here's the problem that you have with women that you don't have. This is what I've been able to do that women won't go to the trouble to do, at least the women you've been in contact mm -hmm. with. Because of my profession, I have the ability and willingness to separate behavior from the individual. So I separate what you do from who you are. Right. But let's look at what you do. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. I mean, really? This Halloween costume? What the hell were you thinking? I was thinking it's Halloween, and you can dress up for Halloween. Throughout the entire time, I had people coming up to me saying, I have to get a picture with you. I have to, I have to. And you, I was like, okay. You know okay. why? Because they're going to go home and say, hey, come here, you're not going to believe this <laughs> that's, that's why. And on Labor Day, you posted, uh, hey, it's Labor Day. Any women want to go into labor nine months from now? Give me a call. It's a joke. I yes. understand it's a joke. Mm -hmm. But... Did you have a lot of women call up and laugh? I had, a, I had a lot of them laugh. And you post your crazy dating stories on Facebook? I, okay, wait a second. I do, but I've never ever used a name or referred it to who it would be, and so I would never do that. You use your name? Uh, yes, I do. But I, I have found, and this is just personal experience, People actually request to hear it because they're so bizarre. I think some people learn from it, like, I can't believe that's what's out there in the dating world. And I'm like, yes, and I can't believe it happens to me so much. Yeah. So you post that stuff? How's Generally, not all the time. Well, how's that working for you? For people's entertainment, well, but not good for dating. Well, and what's your goal? I mean, do you want to be a clown or do you want to date? I definitely want to date. Then stop being a clown. Okay. <laughs> this past weekend, we set Adam up on a speed date with these five women. They each met him for five minutes. Do any of them want to go on a second date? And which one does Adam have his eye on? We're going to find out later. But first, Adam met a woman at a friend's barbecue last year and asked her out. She'll tell us why the date never happened. Next. Hello, Hi, I'm Adam. Nice to meet nice you. To meet you. Have you ever done anything like this before? Are you local? Have you ever watch wrestling? Tomorrow. Imagine being locked in the bathroom and told if you move, you would be beaten and burned. You are forced to eat what is in the dustpan. Someone pulls out your tongue and cuts a part of it off with clippers. I can't even imagine what you have called life up to this point. That's tomorrow. Then on Thursday, a family at war. He will have that scar for the rest of his life. Over a toddler treadmill injury. It's your job, not hers. She doesn't have a two and a half year old. You do.
That's Thursday. To the best of my knowledge, all of my friends think that I'm a good catch. But they say, well, maybe God is just calling you to be single. And I say, well, if he's calling me to be single, I think he is dialing the wrong number. I'm very tired of being single because it wears on you. Okay, Adam says he's the 47-year-old relationship virgin. Out of hundreds of first dates he's been on, only two or three women have ever gone on a third date with him. He says women always put him in the friend zone. His friends say maybe he's trying too hard. Now, these are his friends. Take a look. I have known Adam for 10 years, and it is absolutely mind-boggling to me to think that he's never made it to a fourth date with a woman. Adam and I have been friends for about six years. He's not a player. Number one, he's in his 40s. He still likes to frequent college bars, younger people. Quite frankly, aren't particularly looking for guys in their 40s. Adam met this female. They were talking all night long, right? Well, then at the end of the night, the girl looks at Adam and says to him, the only reason she was talking to Adam was because she thought Adam was gay. I've only met Adam once. I just immediately put Adam into the friend zone. And I feel the moment he feels there's just a little bit of hope, he just bounces. Adam came on just maybe a little bit too strong for me. I don't think he kind of understands sometimes when he makes women uncomfortable. He's just way too eccentric. Well, Kendra and Adam were introduced by a mutual friend who was hoping they would hit it off at her barbecue last year. But Kendra says that just didn't happen. She's joining us on Polycom. Why did you text your friend after meeting Adam and say, ugh? Well, it's, the day was fine. It was great. We were just chit-chatting and talking. Um, but by the end of the day, he just came off a little bit too strong. And I was like, it's just a little bit too much. What, what do you take from that? What I take from that is, is that I messaged her, a, I believe it was maybe a day or two after the barbecue, and she responded back, like, continuously for like two weeks. So the message that I thought I was being sent was there was interest, so that's why I was reaching out. And you responded back every time because you were yes, being... Yes, I did. Well, I always do. I'm just one of those people, if you text me and stuff, I'm definitely going to respond. Two of Adam's best friends, Nick and Byron, are baffled that Adam can't find love. They are also joining us on Polycom. <laughs> so let me add them. So guys, you, you say you're baffled, but yet you also gave some pretty insightful reasons that you think he's not connecting. So what's the baffled part? Uh, I think it has to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll diagnose it as Adam being romantically dehydrated. Yeah. Nick, you're a psychologist. What do you think is going on with Adam? Uh, I think I think there's a distinction between I know Adam really well, so I love Adam. I get everything he says. I understand when he makes jokes, the Facebook comments, because I understand him. But when other people just meet him, there's a disconnection mm -hmm. between what they are seeing and what's actually there for him. And so I think there's a perception problem early on. What's your number one piece of advice? Well, I used to think it's about being really open and honest, but now I'm thinking it's almost impression management and trying to go a little bit slower and tread water a little bit more carefully. Okay, I think that's a great piece of advice. Byron, what would you say? I, I'm along that same line. Take that step back and not be so forward with what you want to say. It's not about playing hard to get, but it's about saying, I don't have to set the feverish pace here I'm going to be patient and let this unfold at someone else's agenda, someone else's pace. I, I hear what you're saying, I agree with that. And what the challenge is for me is people dangle that water in front of me. And like he said, that was a good example. I mean, I'm just trying to be honest. Like, I felt like Kendra was dangling the water in front of me, and I'm like, man, I'm thirsty, and so maybe I could get <laughs> some water. And so, but that happens a lot is like, so I get this interest and then, so yes, I absolutely 100% agree, know that I do come on a little strong because I get so excited. Coming up, five minutes, five different women, Adam speed dating results. Anyone interested in a second date? We're gonna find out next. Hello, Hi, I'm Adam. Nice 
Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I have an opening question for you. How do you feel about guys that have droids instead of iPhones? <laughs> As a guy, you probably shouldn't admit that you watch Keep Up with the Kardashians. It's like the Brady Bunch. I felt like I was talking to a dun 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 family member. Well, 47-year-old Adam says, I'm his only hope in figuring out why he's never had a girlfriend. Now, I needed to see him in action, so we enlisted five single women looking for love to meet up with Adam for a round of speed dating. Now, they each got five minutes to get to know him, and we took some excerpts out of these five minutes. Take a look. Hello. Hi, I'm Adam. nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Hi. And what's your name? Michelle. Michelle. What's next on your bucket list for travel? I want to go to Australia. I've never, like, eaten kangaroo, so, like, chicken. Who knows? How many states would you say you've lived in? I grew up outside Boston, and then okay. I lived in New Orleans. Well, yeah, you don't have a Boston accent at all. I don't. Which is yeah, good. I have an opening question for you. How do you feel about guys that have droids instead of iPhones? They do cat rescue. How many cats do you currently own? I currently have two. You look okay. very wary when you <laughs> ask that question. Well, you know the stigmatism of cat ladies. Crazy cat ladies. Crazy cat ladies. No. You have go-to shows that you watch? If I'm watching reality, it's probably the Kardashians. Well, I get no that shame in that. As a guy, you probably shouldn't admit that you watched Keep Up With The Kardashians, and it was good because it's dramatic. It's like the Brady Bunch. When I met Adam, I just wasn't able to get to know him. Adam was very, like, a fixture on the wall, like furniture. I didn't get a lot of back-and-forth emotional energy. I felt like I was talking to a dun-dun-dun family member. I got a vibe that he was just telling me what I wanted to hear, and I didn't feel like I could trust him. How long would you date them before you would want to get into a committed relationship and start a family? I don't know if that's a trick question or not. I saw a tiny little panic attack flash across his face when I said that I helped run a cat rescue. Okay, so how did you feel? Did anybody jump out at you? But I do feel like there was a, a little bit of a connection with maybe two. Mm -hmm. All right, and I, I won't even ask you which two yet. I saw many examples here where you didn't respond to what they said at all. Just let me show you an example. I do triathlons. How many have you done? Maybe a, a, around five. I think that's amazing. So do you not watch a lot of TV? <laughs> <laughs> I did follow up because later on I said so, and it was short, very short after that, I said out of the three events, which one is your favorite event? And so, you know, she said, oh, definitely swimming. I've swam my whole life. So I was listening. This next example, uh, Elena is telling Adam about her son, Adam. Again, no follow-up, takes the conversation down a strange path. They have two exchange students. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where are they from? Uh, Spain and Vietnam. Okay. Two boys, 16. Yeah. Um, so they've been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So I have a 25-year-old boy, so I was like, yeah, I remember that age. That was kind of fun. Yeah. So. Can be. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> well, and they're not yours, so they're yeah, going to yeah. be 10 times better. Yeah, of course, so. of course. <laughs> and so they how, have. How do you feel about the Oregon Ducks uniforms? <laughs> the Oregon Ducks uniforms. Again, there's more to the story. She said she's from Oregon, and so anyone involved with sports or anything, and we had talked about sports, said that every woman is shaking her head no at me right now, but the, the Oregon Ducks are known for the uniform. So I did, like, I, there was more of a transition to that. That was not an edit. We didn't edit that. That, that was the actual flow. No, I'm wanting you to learn I, from I, it. I hear you, I, and I, I really I am, because now I'm like, I can't wait to go out and listen and follow up and do all those things. Adam says he knows who he wants to go out with again, but let's meet the ladies and see if any of them feel the same way. Crystal, I'm sorry. Was that a good observation? It's season 18! Whatever the case. She says her mother absolutely ruined her wedding. That's the first time I heard that. She just drops my, woo, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. 
Thank you, Jesus. Sorry, I get I get animated. I get animated. I'm sorry, Dr. Phil. I've noticed that. Whatever the challenge. Wealthy people can get away with anything. So did you or did you not murder your wife? One show. Those are my children! When they saw this, the school went on lockdown. Oh. Has you covered. That doctor was telling me your daughter has passed away. This was not an act of God. She was murdered. You want us to keep our relationship private, but you can't even keep your privates private. I'm here for my relationship and nobody's letting me talk. She'll be back. There's no way to get out over there. You either live or you die. You came out of it. You survived. You're still here. you got to have a process to get back into your life, and I'm going to start that process right now, immediately. An all-new season starts September 9th. Good it takes. says he knows who he wants to go out with again, but let's meet the ladies and see if any of them feel the same way. So please welcome Michelle, Tracy with an I, Tracy with a Y, <laughs> Elena, and Nellie. All right? Put you in here. Well, ladies, thank you very much, and thanks for participating in this experiment. Um, so, you're Michelle. Right. Uh, nice to meet you. Sorry. Good to meet you. How was your experience? There was, like, hummus on the table. Like, it was just as stale as the conversation, right? Like, am I going to eat this? Am I going to talk to it? I didn't know what to do. Yeah. But he was uh, so nice. Yeah, he was really nice. So. Yeah. So, did you like him? I thought he was nice. But then I thought about it. It was like, maybe he wasn't breastfed enough as a child. Did your mom breastfeed you? I was thinking maybe he didn't have a good, like, close relationship with Dr. his mom, so he doesn't know how to interact. A little bit? Dr. Phil, I'm sorry. Was that a good observation? I'm just, I'm trying to help him. I think no. maybe you two should get to know each other. I was <laughs> uh, beautiful, and she was nice, and I... I think she would be a fun person to, like, have a drink with. So, Elena, oh. do you feel like he was listening to you? I don't, I don't know if he really was. Um, I think I just, I think he had questions in his head, and, uh, and then they just spilled out after I answered. Tracy, what did you think? I actually had a different experience. I thought uh, you were very easy to talk to, Adam, and I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, good. So, <laughs> see, you got across the road with her. <laughs> so... Nelly, did you feel like he was connecting with you? Did you feel like he was interested in you? What was your re reaction? I think you're interested in getting to know me. And I thought I w was interested in getting to know you more. It was very quick. Yeah. So, Tracy, you thought Adam was robotic and kind of like a puppet, just kind of moving along. What do you mean? Mm -hmm. Well, I, what I meant by that was that I just kind of felt like he was editing everything he was saying. So I felt like I couldn't really connect with him. We're going to go to the next level of an experiment. So who would you like to s speak to? Because I'm going to have you go speak to one of them now, just okay. the two of you. Um, I feel like there was a little bit better flow of conversation with Tracy. Okay. Then I'm going to ask you to go back. I'm going to have you stay here for a minute because okay. I'm going to talk to you for a second. I'm going to have you go back. Okay, she's, she's going back to the green room, and I, you're going to go back and sit down and chat with her. Okay. Okay? But I'm going to put a muzzle on you. Th this is a muzzle, but it's really uh, just what's called an IFB. I I'm going to put this in your ear. You can take that out and put it in your ear, and I'm going to talk to you while you're in there. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I, I want you to listen to what I tell you. I'm not going to say very much. Okay. All right, coming up, when I get in Adam's ear, let's see if he can snag another date with Tracy. We'll be right back.
what you do for fun. So for fun, on like a weekend, what, what's your top type of uh, uh, activities that you do? Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. Imagine being locked in the bathroom, beaten and burned, forced to eat what is in the dustpan. I can't even imagine what you have called life up to this point. That's tomorrow. Now, after a round of speed dating with five really lovely single ladies, Adam said he wanted to speak some more to Tracy and get to know her better. Now, the goal is for Adam to get another date and to be appropriate so I'm in his ear but Tracy doesn't know that we'll tell her when we're done of course Adam I just want you to ask her to tell you more about herself that you're really so, interested in getting to know her I definitely like want to get to know you more and more about you because I know it's such a short but you know if you it's had short. yeah so yeah five definitely. minutes I always say it's either if you if you're on a quick date like that it's either Five minutes goes like that, or it's the longest five minutes of your life. Right. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like you experienced both. <laughs> I thought it was five, very fast because I thought our conversation went really well. And I thought so, so too. So it was good to talk. It's just very So flowing. tell me more about yourself. Not a lot of awkward pauses. Yeah, yeah. So if you had a couple quick things that you like, could tell me about yourself, like what are some top things that you would share? Um, I'm a little quirky sometimes. Um, I don't know if you'll, if you'll get that, but uh, I come off as very serious, but I'm not always that serious. Mm. Um, we talked about the cat rescue. I saw you panic a little bit. Are you not a cat person? You have dogs. I have dogs. Right. Monkey and... <laughs> Monkey and mister. Mister. And, no, when you said that, it, I just envisioned cat rescue of mm -hmm. like 100 cats, but that's, uh, two cats is, yeah, that's awesome that you have pets. No, yeah, let well, her we do talk. have 100. Let they her talk, tell you more me. about herself. Okay. All the time. Okay, so Sometimes. cat rescue is a big part of your life. How long have you been doing that? It is. I've um, been doing it for, gosh, out in L.A. for about 10 years. Okay. A few years before that. Um, I love dogs. I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I don't love all animals because I do. Yeah. Um, but cats are easier to stash. To stash? In your apartment when you're fostering. <laughs> I've never heard them stash before. They don't bark. Nobody hears yeah. them. Okay. Um, no, I'm being a little facetious. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so how did you get your dogs? Are they rescues? They were both rescues. I, I wish more people would get rescue pets God, because that's, that's amazing. There's amazing dogs in there. So, so tell me what you do for fun. So for fun, on like a weekend, what, what's your top type of uh, uh, activities that you do? Oh Is it more with friends or just? I am going to sound like the most boring person that you've ever met. Okay. What I generally do is Friday night, come home from work, the first thing I do, I go to the gym, um, put on my pajamas, and sit on the sofa and watch some TV. Okay. Yep. So tell me about your um, family. But it, that's, that's my favorite thing. It would be really nice to have people to do that with. But, you know, I'm not a total homebody. I like to go out sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and not super fancy places, but yeah, just that's fun, good. comfy places, you know. But I like a restaurant as much as I like a diner or a dive bar. Yeah. What about you? So, uh, I definitely like to do those things. I like some TV. Um, I don't have any family in the area, so, you know, where I live, so it's kind of hard. But what about your family? Do you like, are you close with them? Or? My mother is my best friend. Mm -hmm. Super awesome. close with my mom. Yep, she lives in Baltimore, which is where I'm from. Um, we talk 20 you know, times a there. day. I know. So. It's so weird. And you, you um, were in Florida for a little bit, mm -hmm. too. Okay, so you're really close with your mom. Yes. Super okay. close with my mom. How about you, parents? I have parents, yes. Siblings? <laughs> <laughs> I have nine brothers and sisters oh that are mixed gosh. up with some half and step. Um, and do you have siblings too? No, just me. Just you? Mm -hmm. So what would be your dream date? Like, so your dream date. If you, any, you could be anywhere in 15 minutes. Where would you go and what would you do? I'm going to kind of weasel out of that question because my dream date is feeling comfortable with somebody and not feeling like I have to think about what I'm going to say next or, oh my gosh, what is, is he looking at my hair? Is it weird? Mm -hmm. You know, do I have spinach in my teeth? Just to, to forget yeah. about all those things and just have a conversation and let it flow and let it go where it goes. That's well, my you sure thing. make me feel comfortable. What well, about you? Well, before I answer that, okay. <laughs> I have to say, you definitely make me feel comfortable. Good. So that's a good thing. So, um, so that's great. You're on your dream date. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> When we come back, me, we're going to talk to Tracy and see what she thought about him. We'll be right back.
How do you think he did, guys? All right. Great. So how did you feel about the time you spent with him? It was good. I mean, obviously, we walked into a room and we thought, are we, what are, are we supposed to talk? What are we supposed to <laughs> Are they looking at us? Um, but yeah. once we got past that, I think it was good. Did you feel comfortable talking to him? I did. Did you feel like he listened to you? He definitely did. Yeah. He followed up on things that you said? He did. Yeah. Yep, he wasn't just waiting to talk. Full transparency, I put a bug in his ear, and I was telling him what to say. Really? Yes. Because I wanted to muzzle him so he didn't go in there and... You literally had in his ear? Yes. I thought it was a weird tick you had. You were like... <laughs> <laughs> I want to give some more help for Adam. Uh, coach Mike Bear here, he's a very dear friend of mine. Uh, he's a life coach. Uh, he is experienced and loved by his clients. He works with A-list celebrities. He works with people from all over the world. And he focuses on helping his clients break free of destructive patterns behaviorally. He has a book out called Best Self, Be You Only Better. And it sounds like Adam is a perfect candidate. In fact, it seems like you wrote this book for him. <laughs> um, because he needs to be him, only better, because he's a good guy. He's just not putting his best self out there. What would you do with him coaching-wise? Coaching-wise, I mean, we would take a look at who your best self is and who your anti-self is. Why the audience has turned on you in a positive way is because they've gotten to know you. Mm -hmm. The other part, the antics, the neon, ugly sweater, leprechaun, Christmas fiesta, mm -hmm. is not going to lead you towards dating, mm -hmm. right? That's immature, you're 47, that stuff was cool at 16, and that's just, that's just the reality. Women want a man. They want you, they want your best self. So that's what we want to get back to and really help you figure out who that is because how you are showing up in your dates is a result of insecurity, anxiety, you know, fear. And your anti-self is running the show and that's why you're not going on continued dates and that's, not, that's why you're not in a relationship. Mike is also the co-founder of Cast Centers and they have offered to help Adam with some one-on-one -on -one coaching. So you're, you're saying you will get him hooked up with a life coach that will work with him to connect with his best self and get calm and confident so he presents differently in a dating environment. We will. So we'll help you look at all aspects of your life, even when you're not dating, so that you set yourself up so when you walk into the room, when you show up on a date, you feel secure as a man and you feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can help you do. This is Marnie Batista. She is a certified professional dating and relationship coach and a writer with a weekly dating and relationship podcast, The Dating Den. And she was named one of the 10 best women dating experts according to datingadvice.com. Wow. Now, Marnie, you do this from an expert standpoint and you have agreed to help him going forward specifically in the dating arena, correct? Absolutely. And it's about really making sure that your profile represents the authenticity that Mike is going to help you own. And then bringing that forward in how you present yourself online and offline. So Mike is going to help you in all the areas of your life. This specialist is going to help you. Your life's about to change. Uh, okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. So... Are you guys uh, likely to go on another date? You would say yes, I right? Would say yes, absolutely. If he says yes, I'm saying yes. All right, All right, there you go. Coming up, we have important life-saving information on a major health crisis you do not want to miss. That's next. <laughs> Nearly 70% of the more than 70,000 drug overdose deaths in 2017 involved an opioid. Over the last three years, one in three people prescribed an opioid didn't even know they were taking one or that they could be at risk. Now, I've done over a hundred shows on this topic, 
And dealing with this kind of addiction is not an easy journey. Now, Amy was just 15 when she became dependent on opioids. Here's her story. It's just heartbreaking what, what's going on out there, and it's got to stop. It's an awful thing for a mom to go through. Kathy Mead watched her daughter Amy struggle with opioid addiction from age 14 to 30. She even used while pregnant with her daughter Chloe. And the best thing for her was for me to sign away my parental rights. It makes me feel sad because um, that she wasn't really around for most of my life. It's hard for me to look at photos of her when she was young because I wasn't there when she took her first steps. I wasn't there when she started school. Narcan gave Amy a second chance at life. She has been sober for more than six years and now helps others in recovery. Narcan, an opioid reversal drug. As you can see in this body cam footage, Narcan revives the patient within seconds. I have a message. There is hope through this. That overdose saved my started life. It. Yeah, instead of ending it, it started it. Well, Amy was one of the lucky ones. And joining me today is Tom Duddy, Vice President of Communications for Adapt Pharma, our segment sponsor and the company that makes the medication that reversed Amy's opioid overdose. So thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Now, Amy was revived by Narcan, and I actually heard about this product I just had a major shoulder reconstruction, and I had a, a pain specialist uh, that did nothing but that part of the, the treatment team, and he was telling me about this, and I was so impressed. Explain what this is. Yes. So Narcan is naloxone, and it is a medication that's non-addictive and it can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose if it's given in time. Tom, there are those who say if there are prescription opioids in the house, this product should be there too. Why is that? The overdoses are happening in the home. They're not happening in the community. And opioids in very high doses or high strength opioids uh, can cause your breathing to slow, cause your heart rate to slow, and this is, causes a lack of oxygen. And then essentially, this can be deadly. Right. So Narcan counteracts those life-threatening effects. And you may need some additional doses. Right. Now, in most cases, an opioid overdose is accidental. And it can occur even if the, the, the medication is being used as directed, right? Correct. Especially when someone is, is taking high doses. And an overdose may look like unusual sleepiness or you, they can't awaken. Pupils are very small, slow or shallow breathing, right? Mm -hmm. And since every second counts, if a person stops breathing, what should you do if you are with someone who has overdosed on opioids? Well, if you have Narcan, you would place this right. in one nostril. Right. And then you press the button and you call 911 right away. Uh, because it's critical to get additional medical care. Look at this. I've been so impressed with this that Robin and I have this at home. I, I have it in both of our cars because you never know when you're going to drive up on a situation where somebody's that way. We have these everywhere uh, because I think they're just so profoundly important. And you can get this without a doctor's prescription. Uh, so where can it be purchased? Where can somebody get this? You can walk in your local pharmacy and talk to your pharmacist without a prescription. It's important to know that Narcan is not a substitute for emergency medical care and do not use Narcan if there's an allergy to naloxone hydrochloride. And there are some risks and side effects that are associated with Narcan, such as acute opioid withdrawal symptoms. Here's a look at some opioid withdrawal symptoms everyone should be aware of. Signs of overdose include breathing problems, severe sleepiness, or not responding. Narcan is not a substitute for emergency medical care, so after using, call 911 even if they wake up. Additional doses may be needed. Opioid withdrawal symptoms can occur suddenly after using Narcan, including increased blood pressure and or heart rate and involuntary movement. Oh. 
So, Tom, where can people get additional information about this? So for more information and a complete list of our side effect profile, along with our instructions for use and full prescribing information, you can go to Narcan.com. Okay. And, but again, th you don't need a prescription for this. In all 50 states, you do not. You can walk into any pharmacy, but you have to ask f the pharmacist. It's not in, on the rows. Yeah. Don't you all think this is amazing? I mean, it's just... And this opioid epidemic is out of control. I say this is a life-changing game changer. So I think it's so important. Okay, I want to thank all of my guests today. Tom, thank you so much for being thank here you, to Dr. talk about this. And for more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Don't forget to subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks, and also my podcast series, Analysis of Murder by Dr. Phil. Both of them are free, and you can find them on Apple Podcast app. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.